morning, everybody. Uh, we uh, would like to finish up the chapter on the units used for ionizing radiation. And uh, as we have already done, uh, we have defined the unit of the activity uh, in terms of the Curie in the conventional system and the uh, unit of the Becquerel in the SI system of units. We also uh, uh, defined the unit of the exposure in the Rontgen in the case of the uh, conventional system of units, as well as the Coulomb per kilogram of air uh, in the SI system of units. Uh, we defined the third unit for the measurement of radiation, which is the radiation absorbed dose or the rad uh, in the conventional system of units and the equivalent gray in the uh, SI system of unit. We establish a correspondence between the red and the gray is that one red is one centigrade or one hundredth of a gray. And we went further and uh, defined a unit that uh, corresponds to the effects of radiation on living matter on biological systems. In that case, it was the REM or the radiation equivalent man in the conventional system and its equivalent the sievert in the SI system of units. And we establish a correspondence that one rem is one centisiever, one hundredth of a siever. Then we went further and uh, gave estimates of uh, what is the average radiation doses that we get as individuals. And we are ready to set up some kind of criteria and limits on how to uh, control radiation in the sense that we'd like to be able to minimize uh, its uh, deleterious effects and maximize, obviously, whatever uh, good effects it has. Along this line, uh, we'll also try today to cover the case of non-ionizing radiation, which is becoming ubiquitous, like when you use our uh, computer screens or when we use uh, uh, cell phones or uh, uh, Wi-Fi on our computers, we are using microwaves radiation uh, also, when we use the 5G type or 4G communication systems, we are also subjecting uh, our biological systems, our bodies and hum other humans to uh, a form of radiation that is not ionizing, but uh, it seems that uh, uh, we need to still uh, care about it. So this is uh, our goal today. We go back uh, to the chapter that we started last time on the uh, ionizing radiation uh, units, and that is units and standards. So we covered the units today, we covered the standards. Uh, I suggested last time that you may have fun uh, filling up that form uh, to measure your own uh, level of uh, dose of radiation that you receive uh, per uh, year. So let us go there and see if we can go over it very quickly. Uh, you'll find that uh, you can compute uh, uh, your radiation uh, dose, not the radiation dose in red, but the effective dose in REM, radiation equivalent man, or in fact, the REM is a large unit, so we use a milli REM. Uh, the average dose of radiation that you get depends on where you live. So if you are at sea level, you don't have the benefit of the Earth's atmosphere to protect you from cosmic radiation. And the thicker the atmosphere above your head, the more uh, protection uh, the atmosphere of the Earth provides you with uh, 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 protection against cosmic radiation. Cosmic radiation comes to us uh, on an isotropic way from all different sides of the rest of our universe. So in that case, you can get uh, ions of iron carrying energies, not in the kilo electron volt, not in the million electron volt, but in the giga electron volt. Those ions of cosmic radiation interact with the upper atmosphere and uh, generate neutrons and gamma rays and pions and muons, all kinds of interesting particles. In fact, they form a shower. So we might be sitting each one here at our desk in front of our computer and some cosmic radiation creating showers of radiation uh, irradiating us. If you are at sea level, we have the benefit of the atmosphere to protect us against that cosmic radiation. 
And uh, at sea level, each one of us on the average received a dose or effective dose to be exact. This is 44 milliram per capita or per person per year. Now, if you live at a higher elevation from sea level, you have less of an atmosphere to protect you. So in that case, you receive a higher dose. For instance, if you live uh, in Chicago, uh, the elevation of Chicago are up above sea level is 575 feet, while here Champaign-Urbana, we are at 700 uh, feet above sea level. So for each 100 feet of elevation, you receive an extra 1 millirem of cosmic radiation. So if we are 700 here, uh, we should add here 7 uh, rem for, uh, uh, so it's 51 rather than 44 if you are just at sea uh, level. Some uh, cities in the United States are much higher. Uh, the one that is uh, very famous is uh, uh, the city of, uh, let's see here, uh, not Las Vegas. Las Vegas is 2,000 feet, but uh, Denver, Colorado. Denver, Colorado is at an elevation of 5,280 feet. Uh, if you live there, uh, and uh, interestingly, if you visit Denver, you go up there, uh, there, uh, there, uh, uh, there, uh, there uh, uh, on the city, you'll have their, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, their uh, courthouse and you climb up the stairs and uh, you find a step on which they say, okay, uh, this is a one mile high city. So uh, compare this to the 700 feet here at Champaign-Urbana or the 595 at Chicago, and uh, definitely, if you live in Denver, Colorado, you are receiving much more uh, cosmic radiation than if you live at sea level. Uh, depending on the construction of the home that you live in, if it is a wood house, well, there is radiation in the wood, in the carbon-14. So you end up getting a 35 uh, milliram per person per year. On the other hand, if you live in a stone house or a brick house, uh, the materials of the bricks or the stone contain uranium and thorium and their decay products. So you get 50 to 45 milliram per person uh, per year. If you walk on the ground, in the fields, in the streets, you find that the soil itself contains uranium and thorium. Uh, basically, uh, if you spend one fourth of your time outdoors, uh, you get 15 milliram per person per year. Uh, the United States uh, average for what we drink, eat and breathe uh, is uh, 25 milliram per person per year, and still some radiation from the testing of nuclear weapons in the atmosphere in the 1950s is falling down uh, to the earth. That's a weapon test fallout. We get each one about four milliram per person per year. Now we have, of course, a different lifestyle. Some people uh, exercise outdoors. Uh, you take part in sports events. Uh, you'll find that uh, basically uh, uh, the way we live, uh, 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 for instance, if you go and hurt your uh, ankle, you don't know whether it's broken or whether it's only just sprained, uh, you get uh, x-rays. Uh, so if you get a chest x-rays, each one would provide you with 10 milliram per person per x-ray. And uh, the number of lower gastrointestinal tract x-rays, each one now would give you 500. So, and uh, the United average dose for the whole body uh, is basically uh, 100 uh, uh, milliram per person per year. So that adds up to the radiation dose that we get from man-made uh, causes. If you travel by uh, airplanes, obviously you travel at 30,000 feet. Uh, so you don't have the benefit of the atmosphere there. Definitely pilots, for instance, of airplanes receive a much larger dose than uh, uh, people uh, who are living at the surface of the earth, uh, flight attendants get also uh, uh, those. So for each 1,500 uh, miles traveled by jet airplane, uh, you get uh, one milliram of uh, those uh, equivalent dose of uh, radiation. Uh, in Europe, uh, flight attendants who are pregnant uh, are not allowed to fly because uh, the fetus as a growing type of a system of cells uh, can, it's very sensitive to, in that case, space radiation. Uh, in the United States, the, their uh, flying uh, uh, is limited 
uh, when uh, they are uh, uh, pregnant. Uh, TV viewing, the TVs uh, use electrons to create the picture on the screen. So, so do uh, uh, laptop computers and phones. So depending uh, on how many hours per day you watch your TV, you get 0.15 milliram per hour per uh, day. Uh, if uh, you live uh, next to a nuclear power plant, definitely there is radiation there too. As a side boundary, the average is uh, the number of hours uh, per day is uh, uh, 0.2 per hour per day, milliram per person per year. Uh, if you are living one mile away, uh, that's uh, uh, the uh, average number of hours per day is 0 0.02. If you live five miles away, it's, uh, it goes down by another factor of 10. Over five miles away from a nuclear power station, there is no radiation that you get. You can add up all these numbers here and uh, compare it uh, to uh, the average annual uh, dose is 220 milliram per person per year, both from the uh, artificial sources uh, and the uh, uh, man-made uh, sources. Uh, if you eat too much, you find that you can get more radiation into your body. So if you increase your diet by 4%, uh, you increase your uh, effective dose by one milliram. If you move to an elevation on a hill or on a mountain, every 100 feet higher gives you one extra milliram per person per year. And uh, if you go and uh, spend your vacation uh, hiking on the trails in the Sierra Nevada mountains uh, or the Rocky Mountains or the uh, Appalachian Mountains, uh, then uh, you spend, if you spend a five day vacation, uh, you get uh, uh, more radiation from cosmic radiation as well as radiation from the ground. So this is a, a, just a rough estimate of the radiation that we all uh, get from the natural radiation environment. We go back to our table here that uh, we described last time. Uh, uh, each one of us gets from the natural sources around 126 milliram now per person per year. And from the artificial sources, x-rays, uh, radiotherapy, uh, uh, we get another 61. So two thirds uh, of our radiation is from the natural radiation environment. One uh, 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 third is really from uh, medical applications and other uh, industrial man-made sources. So the total here in the table is slightly different than uh, the, uh, what we discussed earlier. It's in the range of 200 milliram per person per year that we all get uh, uh, per year from different sources. Uh, radiation, uh, of course, affects uh, biological matter. Uh, X-ray, uh, gamma rays, for instance, uh, would uh, uh, ionize the uh, genes on the strands of uh, the chromosomes uh, in the cells in our body. And uh, we said that the ionization can break the molecule uh, so it can have deleterious effects on biological matter if it is uh, in excess above what basically humans have evolved and other animals and plants have evolved to uh, within, within the natural radiation environment. Uh, however, the, uh, our uh, consensus is that uh, if we have sources of radiation, there is no reason whatsoever for us to increase uh, the amount that we get beyond uh, what our livelihood allows it to be and uh, uh, beyond what natures uh, have uh, subjected us over uh, in our evolution, over our uh, uh, long time evolution. So in terms of limiting uh, radiation uh, 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 exposure to humans, uh, we have several principles for protecting ourselves, our co-workers and members of the public at large. Uh, the first uh, consideration is to limit the time over which we are exposed to radiation. And uh, of course, uh, the radiation damage is cumulative, meaning that uh, more radiation your body receives, say from x-rays or from sources of radiation in the environment, the more damage accumulates. So it accumulates over time. But uh, so if you have a short uh, exposure in time, then you reduce uh, the dose of radiation that you get. The distance, uh, the radiation follows uh, like uh, when we sold the 
equation for the point source in an infinite medium, you find that the uh, distance uh, uh, reduces the intensity of radiation from the source. And then we don't stop there. We also shield the sources of radiation and shield the people employed, like in x-ray departments as hospitals, uh, both the patients and the people administering the x-rays uh, shield themselves. Uh, so you use barriers of lead, concrete, or water. These all give very good protection against radiation. And uh, the fourth principle to protect against radiation is to contain it. Uh, you don't spread it to, in the environment, and uh, that's why uh, nuclear power plants are closed systems. Uh, fission products from the radiation are not released to the environment, unlike uh, coal power plants or fossil fuel power plants, where the products of combustion are simply diluted in the environment because the uh, amounts of those uh, uh, products of combustion, like the sulfur dioxide, the uh, carbon dioxide, are just enormous. And uh, uh, we're not going to get now into the issues of uh, carbon dioxide uh, emission uh, at that point. What are the sources of radiation exposure? Uh, uh, basically, uh, in addition to the natural sources, uh, it can come in from a wide range of sources, man-made sources from hospitals, research institutions, nuclear reactors, and their support facilities in general. And uh, in that case, you find that uh, 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 we are uh, not just uh, subject to exposure to radiation from the natural environment, and uh, also from our industrial kind of civilization. We have other sources that enhance our livelihood, but that uh, uh, expose us to some risk. Well, that's also the same as other activities we have, like driving cars uh, enhances our livelihood. Uh, we don't uh, ride horses or uh, oxen anymore, but uh, at the same time, we get a risk of uh, accidents and, uh, uh, of course, uh, and. Uh, uh, particularly accidents in car uh, uh, events. What are the consequences of exposure to radiation? Uh, ionizing radiation uh, affects people by depositing energy in body tissue, uh, which can cause cell damage or cell death. Uh, the damage over a long period of time would lead to multiplication that is abnormal. And in that case, of a 10, 20, a 20 year period, you'll find that the, you end up with a tumor. However, uh, radiation can be more intense. It can cause the death of a cell in the human body. Uh, the body has defense mechanisms. It really rebuilds the cell in some cases. Uh, if the radiation dose is very high, the body is unable to uh, uh, rebuild the dead cells. And in that case, it shows as uh, in, form of, uh, in the form of what we call radiation sickness. Uh, the evidence of the damage from low or moderate doses of radiation may not show up for months or even years. For instance, leukemia, the minimum time between uh, the radiation exposure and the appearance of the disease is about two years. Uh, for solid tumors, the latency period is about uh, five years. So uh, in general, uh, we do not uh, uh, expose ourselves or other people to radiation uh, uh, in a uh, haphazard way, uh, exposure to radiation follows the principle of ALARA, we call it. ALARA stands for as low as reasonably achievable. If your job as a medical doctor is to work with x-rays, well, you get exposed to some form of radiation, uh, but uh, you do it in as low as reasonably uh, uh, achievable. There are two types of radiation exposure. Uh, uh, in accidental situation, you get an acute radiation exposure. And I uh, would set up a limit on how much radiation you can get. Uh, people working in uh, nuclear installations carry a badge that measures, or an ionization chamber that measures the amount of radiation that their body re received uh, in that case. Chronic radiation is more like radiation that we received uh, from our livelihood for some people, for instance, in uh, countries like Brazil or Ceylon uh, or Egypt uh, have deposits uh, uh, from the rivers or on their seashores of materials that contain radioactive elements like the ore ilmenites 
or the black sands. If you travel to Florida to the beach, you'll find that there are some black sands. Those black sands contain uh, radioactive uh, elements. Acute exposure uh, is exposure to a large single dose of radiation or a series of doses for a short uh, period. For humans and other mammals, ac ac accidental exposure or acute exposure uh, can cause rapid development of what we call the radiation sickness. Uh, you'll find that the radiation affects primarily the lining of the gastrointestinal tract. So it kills the cells lining the intestinal tract. And in that case, the bacteria that live there that are beneficial to our body uh, start attacking the body and you end up getting uh, hemorrhaging, anemia, loss of body fluids, which would be diarrhea and electrolyte uh, imbalance. Uh, however, the delayed biological effects can include if you expose the eye cataracts, uh, temporary sterility, if the gonads or the reproductive organs are affected, uh, cancer, genetic effects in general. Extremely high level of acute radiation exposure can result in death within a few hours, days, or uh, weeks. So we have a uh, health effect risk from radiation. And uh, let's look uh, quickly at, uh, since now we have a way of measuring uh, the radiation, and uh, I'm going to use interchangeably the unit of the radiation equivalent man, the REM, uh, and the REM uh, is the same as one hundredth of a sievert. So in that case, we can interchangeably use the conventional system of unit and the, uh, the SI system uh, of unit. Uh, if you are at the level of 1,000 REM or 1,000 centisievert, uh, in fact, at 10 only, uh, basically a whole body dose uh, would cause immediate sickness. You get the nausea, decreased white blood cell count because uh, that ionizing radiation also acts on the bone marrow uh, in our spine and the bone marrow is the organ in our body where the white blood cells that protect us against disease uh, are being uh, produced. So in that case, at 10 sieverts of radiation, uh, you basically subject the body to death within a few weeks. Between two and 10 sieverts in a short term dose would cause severe radiation sickness with increasing the likelihood that that would be fatal. And that's unfortunately used uh, in some form of for, uh, warfare where uh, they have developed what they call neutron bombs. And neutron bombs would be uh, nuclear devices that generate a very large no uh, dose of neutrons, uh, not X-rays or blast wave, but particularly neutrons. And in that case, they can penetrate fortifications, they can penetrate tank uh, walls and uh, uh, basically make the, uh, uh, the combatants that who are exposed to it extremely sick. And uh, in that case, they lose their ability to be a fighting uh, force. Uh, one sievert uh, in the short term dose is about the threshold for causing immediate radiation sickness. Uh, about 100 centisievert or 100 rem, remember centisievert and rem are equivalent, you get a severity, uh, the severity of sickness increases with the dose. At uh, doses greater than 100 centisievert, uh, they're less likely to have er early air health effects but they create a definite risk that cancer will develop say five or 10 years later. Above 10 centisievert, the probability of cancer rather than the severity of illness increases with the dose. Uh, the estimated risk of fatal cancers is five uh, out of 100 person exposed, or 5% of the people exposed to 100 centisievert. This is a very, very large dose. And uh, that is the dose of at the level of people exposed to radiation in the bombings of Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and at the Chernobyl uh, accident. Uh, the, basically, the people who fought the fire at the Chernobyl accident were affected at that level. If the normal instance of fatal cancer were 25%, uh, this dose would increase it to 30%. Now, if you go down to the level of 5 centisievert uh, or 5 rem, uh, this has been observed conservatively to be the lowest dose at which there is no evidence of cancer being caused in adults. Uh, it is also the highest dose which is allowed by regulation in any one year of occupational exposure. So you are in, uh, get occupational exposure if you work, say, in the x-ray department in a hospital or if you work on 
a nuclear submarine uh, or you use radiation uh, as, a, as a surgeon, uh, uh, maybe to cure uh, cancers or disease. So five centisieverts seems to be a limit above which, uh, below which uh, there is no uh, observable any deleterious effect. So it is used as a standard as we'll see in a moment. Uh, those rates greater than five centisievert per year arise from natural background levels, as I suggested, in several parts of the world, uh, and they do not cause discernible harm to the local population that live in environments where the soil basically contains thorium maybe or uranium uh, over which they live. Like if you live in the Rocky Mountains or Appalachian Mountains, the mountain the material contains granite and granite definitely contains uh, uranium and thorium. So in that case, uh, we set up limits, allowable limits for exposure to radiation uh, that would allow us to deal with radiation both in the environment and from man-made sources at a level that is not uh, shown to cause any harm. Again, now this is a a dose rate rather than a dose. So the units are the centisievert per year or the same as rem per year. And the magic uh, number here is two. Uh, two is the uh, millirem per person per year uh, or two centisievert per person per year or average over five years. This is the limit for radiological personnel such as employees in the nuclear industry, uranium or mineral sands miner and hospital workers who are closely, uh, all of them should be also closely uh, monitored. One uh, milliram per person per year is the maximum actual dose uh, received actually by uranium miner. Uh, uh, the uh, 0.3 to 0.5 is a typical dose above background received by uranium miners. 0.3 is the background radiation from natural sources in North America, including an average of almost 0.2 centisievert per year from the radon gas in the air. And the Surgeon General uh, has been warning people about the smoke in cigarettes causing cancer, but also the Surgeon General have been warning people about the effects of radon gas in uh, dwellings. So when you buy your first home, uh, before you even sign a contract, you set up some kind of a condition that you are gonna test for the level of radon uh, in the house. Uh, that radon could be formed by having the house built on a deposit of uh, say granite uh, and granite would release into the house that radon gas. Uh, there are standards for the protection then against, uh, uh, against any deleterious effects of radiation. We want to live with radiation uh, in a way that our uh, ancestors and our uh, biology allows it to and the humans have evolved basically uh, within uh, that uh, environment. Uh, the standards for the protection against radiation are set by international bodies that uh, update their uh, criteria uh, as more uh, scientific new knowledge arises. And the main organization, uh, international organization that sets up the standards for the protection against radiation which you all should be aware of, of course, is the ICRP. That's the International Commission on Radiological Protection. And uh, there are three key considerations uh, that they consider in their recommendation. <laughs> uh, first, the justification. You do not uh, expose anybody to radiation uh, as a matter of uh, professional ethics and professionalism. Uh, uh, no practice should be adopted unless its introduction produces a positive net benefit. You don't even expose people to radiation unless you expect a net benefit to come from that exposure to radiation, like taking an X-ray of a foot uh, where the doctor maybe worries that it is not just sprained, but in a sport activity uh, that it may be broken. Otherwise, the, the bone will heal in a uh, in the incorrect way and the person would be limping the rest of his life. Uh, you optimize the radiation exposure. All exposure should be kept as low as reasonably achievable. And that's something that we have to remember that is called the ALARA principle, A-L-A-R-A. -A -A. ALARA, as low as reasonably 
achievable economic and social factors being taken into uh, account. Uh, then we have to limit that radiation. The exposure of individuals should not exceed the limits recommended for the appropriate circumstances uh, in general. So let us quantify this. Uh, before I go further, there are other uh, organizations other than the ICRP, the International Commission on Radiological Protection. In the United States, we have the NCRP, that's the National Council on Radiation Protection and Measurement. The FRC is the Federal Radiation Council. The NRC is the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And the EPA is the Environmental Protection Agency. The standards and the rules for the protection against radiation is the law of the land. And if you want to inspect it, you find your way to uh, the uh, main library and find uh, you make your turn to the right as you enter. And you find yourself in the reference library and uh, you get to the code of federal regulations, which is the law of the land, the CFR uh, in title 10 part 20 or that's designated as 10 CFR-20, uh, you find the laws that pertain to the protection against radiation. Some of those laws are summarized in the table here uh, is that uh, we identified the five uh, RAM uh, or centisiever per person per year uh, as a maximum of five where uh, below which uh, basically there is no observable deleterious effect in terms of our body receives in radiation. Why? The body rebuilds itself. If a cell dies, uh, it, uh, the body renews it. Uh, notice how our skin sheds out and we replace it continuously. The lining of our stomach uh, dies off and the body replenishes it. Our hair falls off and grows and we cut it intentionally and uh, we, uh, the body replaces it. Now that is a five gram per person per year for people who are involved in the uh, nuclear industry or uses of radiation, the medical industry. Uh, so that would be the occupational workers have a maximum limit of five RAM per person per year. If you go to members of the public, we reduce that to one half that amount. So the the, for members of the public, the maximum uh, yearly per capita or per person effective dose is uh, one tenth the five rem per person per year. So that's 0 0.5 millirem, uh, uh, 500 millirem per person per year. However, for the whole population at large, all sources other than medical sources, we reduce that further to 170 millirem per person per year to make it at the same level as the uh, natural radiation uh, environment. Uh, for occupational workers, uh, radiation affects different parts of the body uh, differently. So for the total body red bone, because that's where the white cells uh, are being manufactured in our body, uh, that is limited to 0.005 uh, milliram per, uh, ram per person per year or 5 milliram per person per year. Skin and bone can take up to 30 milliram per person per year and other internal organs, 50 milliram per person per year. However, that five here uh, is a maximum value. And uh, you, you pre please uh, remember this, uh, if you are going to work in any way in a, any radiation environment, people t uh, think it is an average value. No, it is the maximum amount. Uh, the amount that is allowed for a person uh, depends on the age. So uh, any person below the age of 18 has his body really still growing and uh, growing cells are more uh, sensitive to radiation than uh, the grown cells. So if uh, 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 young people below the age of 18 are not supposed to be uh, employed in any radiation environment. If they are above 18, the radiation, the effective dose is cumulative so you take your age minus 18, the age above 18, and uh, over your lifetime, if you work in a career that involves radiation, you are not allowed to take more than two centisievert per person per year. That's the effective dose, yearly dose, uh, over your whole career. So it's if, one, if in one year uh, you receive three uh, 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 rems uh, of radiation, uh, and then the next year, uh, your exposure should be limited. So that two 
uh, is average over a five year uh, period. So again, here I'll emphasize this because that's a misconception and uh, I'll highlight it here. Uh, notice that the value of two is used here for the averaging process rather than the maximum value of five that unfortunately is incorrectly used in some publications. They say, oh, the maximum dose, but you don't expose people to the maximum dose. You give them uh, the 200, which is the level uh, of the, uh, as we have seen in the tables uh, earlier uh, in the lecture uh, that we get uh, from the natural radiation uh, environment. Uh, this relationship suggests that occupational workers can only be exposed to radiation above the age of 18 years at N minus 18, N being the age after the body has nearly completed its growth and maturation stages. It also implies that should an individual be exposed to an amount of uh, exceeding the limit of two centisievert in a given year. So for instance, if he gets five centisievert as a result of an emergency, then the exposure in the following year should be reduced to restore uh, the average uh, value. Uh, uh, the NRC requires that its licensees limit maximum radiation exposure to individual members of the public to 100 millirem or one millisievert per uh, year. Uh, at the boundary of a nuclear power plant, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission maximum per capita per person dose equivalent is five millirem per year. So this is the maximum. Uh, it doesn't mean it is the average which amount to 1% of the individual limit, 3% of the whole population limit as regulated by the ICRP and the FRC and 120th of the natural background at about 102 rem per year. That's what we get uh, from the natural uh, background. That's not 100, as this is milli rem per year. That's, or uh, it's 0 0.102 rem per year. So that is millirem per year. I'll correct that. Uh, uh, for a whole population receiving radiation dose, uh, you'll find that we add up uh, the uh, individual doses of the individuals uh, over the whole population. So in that case, we define what we call the population effective dose. It's an integral over the exposed individuals giving each one a certain dose capital H. And uh, when you take that, uh, N here and multiplied by the average dose, you get what we call the population dose uh, uh, for the whole population. And from there, you can calculate, in fact, uh, how many maybe uh, deleterious effects like cancers would ensue. For instance, if you want to calculate the population dose for a population of 2 million people, half of them receiving 100 millirem and the other half receiving 200 millirem we can calculate the population effective dose as 1 million receiving 100 millirem 10 to minus 3 and then the other 1 million people receiving 200 millirem 200 by 10 to minus 3 millirem and in that case it's a, a number of people so it's a persons multiplied into rem so you find that the population dose would be 3000 persons sievert uh, and uh, uh, from this you can estimate uh, how many people will uh, maybe get the cancer. Okay, so this uh, is table uh, shows us that uh, we all receive uh, on average 228 milliram per person uh, per uh, year. And uh, we have to abide by those uh, rules. And uh, uh, because, uh, and uh, in the case of accidents, of course, it's a different situation. So in that case, we think about the large acute doses. So that would have been a situation at Chernobyl, uh, Three Mile Island and uh, 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 Fukushima. Uh, in that case, we discuss uh, uh, in the same way as in pharmacology when the uh, people in the pharmaceutical business uh, measure the dose of a medication that you take, uh, they measure the effects in terms of uh, uh, the, uh, the dose that would kill a person, obviously, uh, uh, as LD50 slash 30. That means the lethal dose for 50% of the population, that 50 here uh, in, of individuals uh, dying within 30 days. We are talking here about very large doses in accidents or in, uh, say, the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. For humans, that number that would kill 50% uh, of the exposed individuals within 30 days 
is 500 centisieverts for humans. Interestingly enough, it is 10,000 centigrade. Now we don't use sievert for bacteria and adult insects. Only for humans, we use a centisievert unit. So you could see here that uh, uh, 500, you multiply that by uh, 200, uh, is the dose that insects and bacteria can take uh, without being uh, deleteriously or uh, 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 affected. And that's why you'll find those movies where uh, following a nuclear war, uh, basically cockroaches and uh, insects uh, would have survived because they have the protection of their uh, uh, body uh, shield, the chitin in uh, the case of uh, insects. So if uh, humans are stupid enough to uh, start a global nuclear war, uh, the world uh, the, will be still uh, continue uh, living, but uh, it would be populated by insects and by uh, bacteria uh, in general. Uh, some of the uh, effects, uh, early effects of uh, acute or very large doses of radiation, uh, from zero to 50 rem, you don't notice any effect. 50 to 100, you'll find some blood counts are changes that, uh, because of the effects on the bone marrow uh, uh, and the white blood cells in the blood. From 100 to 200, uh, as I suggested, the gastrointestinal tract now cell lining is affected. So the bacteria in our guts invade the body, uh, vomiting occurs. And uh, however, at that level, uh, still 100, 200 uh, people would recover within weeks. If it's 200 to 600, uh, vomiting occurs immediately. Uh, only 20 to 20% maybe of individuals uh, can uh, recover within one month to a year. It's really when uh, a range of 600 to 1,000 large acute dose, then in that case, uh, 80 to 100% of the exposed individuals will die within uh, two uh, months. The data here comes primarily to us from the observation of the survivors of the Nagasaki and Hiroshima uh, uh, events. Uh, this uh, basically uh, uh, some statistics to workers and emergency response personnel at Chernobyl. Unfortunately, that was a case where uh, some individuals were heroic because they knew they were uh, carrying out their duty, the firefighters in particular, uh, while being exposed to radiation doses that could uh, kill them. And uh, uh, the damage uh, or the radiation exposure came in from the fire uh, that caught the graphite, which is carbon uh, uh, moderator in the core at the Chernobyl uh, accident. And uh, in that case, the uh, fission products that contain electrons uh, deposit from smoke actually deposited them uh, uh, was deposited on their skin. They didn't have enough uh, protection there and caused uh, the, ele the electrons being emitted uh, burned their skin. So they caused fourth degree, extremely severe burns. Uh, uh, the number of uh, firefighters uh, were exposed were 22 of them and 21 of them died within uh, four to 50 years. They were heroes of, uh, at that time, the Soviet Union uh, because they basically <coughs> help extinguish the fire and uh, reduce the dose to the rest of the population. Third degree, uh, 23 of them were exposed. Only seven out of them uh, uh, died. And the uh, second degree burns, uh, 200 to 400, only one of them died. And the uh, first degree burn, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, that would be 105 people exposed. None of them uh, died. So the uh, 20, uh, let's say 28, uh, 29, about 30 people died in the Chernobyl accident, 29 to be exact. So this is the most severe exposure that happened in the production of nuclear power so far. Uh, even Fukushima did not cause uh, much uh, damage. Uh, the damage at Fukushima was primarily from the uh, tsunami that killed 19,000 people in that case. Something uh, that's typical of uh, uh, nuclear uh, uh, radiation effects is what we call the linear non-threshold hypothesis. And uh, I will uh, deal with this in the next chapter. 
uh, about hormesis, radiation hormesis. And uh, it turns out that some people suggest that chronic low doses uh, are, can be beneficial in that they uh, 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 stimulate the uh, rest of the body to uh, replenish uh, the radiation in general. So in that case, you find that uh, we have a, you can calculate the cancer risk uh, from a cumulative exposure. Uh, and basically uh, uh, that is uh, a table or a, a figure from a, bio, uh, a report called the biological effects of ionizing radiation committee report. And you could see here that if you get an annual dose rate within the natural environment here, uh, the cancer deaths per million people that by 10 to the minus six could be uh, maybe uh, that's 20. Uh, in that case, so radiation natural background dose being 100 milligram uh, per person per year. A here stands for annum, and annum in Latin means per uh, year. Uh, however, if you, uh, the maximum dose, 100 risk for the ICRP dose limit, uh, you'll find that uh, uh, here at the 500 milligram or 0.5 for the population at large, as we said, then that would result on average of 100 cancer deaths per million people per year. You cannot really uh, differentiate between that level uh, and the level uh, that we get from the natural radiation environment. So it's within the statistical error. So we cannot be sure really when you have some low levels of radiation. So what is the rule? The rule, as I said, is you follow uh, two very important principles. They, in terms of radiation exposure, uh, you add the shielding, uh, you limit the time of exposure, you increase the distance from the radiation source, but basically you expose people as low as reasonably achievable. As long as uh, somebody has to perform their duty uh, in giving an X-ray to a patient, uh, that is as low as reasonably achievable exposure. And uh, another principle has been also uh, uh, expanded or suggested as low as practicable principle. This one is designated as the ASLAP uh, principle. So the, for, in terms of radiation, uh, basically uh, uh, we are incurring risks, but uh, risks uh, that uh, we have no control on if it is from the natural radiation environment. Uh, if it is from man-made sources, then uh, we must be uh, professional and follow ethical principles in the exposure to radiation. So let us look here at the fractional exposure to radiation sources. 60%, 67% of the exposure to radiation we get is from the natural background. Uh, medical radiation gives us 30%, but that has a cost benefit here. With, uh, we don't expose people to medical radiation unless there is like a CT scan of the body, for instance, that is to save lives. And uh, in that case, uh, uh, it is one half the amount that we get or uh, less than one half the amount that we get from the natural radiation environment. Uh, the fallout from weapons testing is 0.6, still continuing as I suggested. Miscellaneous sources 0.5%, occupational exposure 0.5%, let's say, and nuclear energy is 0.15%. So it's a very small amount of uh, compared to what we get from the natural background and for medical radiation uh, in general. Oh, cosmic rays contribute 45 milliram to the annual per capita dose equivalent. So humans and animals and plants have all evolved. And part of the evolution here comes from the cause, cause, causing mutations it turns out that a mutation can be very deleterious for an individual, but uh, mutations are good for the species in that it allows the species to adapt itself to a changing uh, environment in general. So cosmic rays uh, basically are uh, uh, bombarding all of us, uh, humans and animals and plants evolved under that radiation environment. And uh, notice that uh, uh, cosmic rays give us 45 milliram per person per year. Uh, radioactive minerals in the soil, 15 milliram per person per year. Water in food and air, 25 milliram. Travel for a round trip from London to New York, 4 milliram. Diagnostic x rays, 20 milliram. Living in the vicinity of a power plant would be 1 milliram. So, even there, 
uh, we position uh, pop uh, nuclear power plants away uh, from population sources here in the United States. In Europe, uh, Europe, if you travel in Europe, you'll find that it's much more crowded in space, so they're closer to the population centers. Most of human exposure to radiation comes from the natural radiation background and the medical application of radiation. Uh, exposure to radiation has been and is going to be forever a fact of life since the beginning of life on Earth. So we live with radiation, we adapt to it, protect ourselves and other people for unnecessary exposure to radiation. I'll stop sharing and uh, get to the chat room and see if you have any questions about that chapter. If not, I will uh, uh, look at uh, what I mentioned as uh, uh, the suggestion by some people that uh, uh, low levels of radiation can be beneficial and just uh, uh, discuss the issue uh, uh, and also in that case show you how radiation has been used in uh, uh, snake oil type of applications. At some point it was thought, oh, it would be beneficial, but it is not in many circumstances. And exposure to radiation should be on the basis of scientific knowledge, not on a haphazard way. If there are no questions, I'll go back and uh, cover another uh, chapter in our notes here. And uh, the chapter on radiation or mazes. I get all these questions when I teach uh, that uh, topic here, radiation or mazes. And uh, uh, so I would like to cover it uh, today. It's of interest, uh, great interest in terms of uh, how uh, a technology can be misused until you learn more about it. And uh, uh, I give a quote by Thomas Edison here. We do not know a millionth of 1% about anything. Well, that is not quite right. We know something about something. Uh, but uh, let's look at the uh, idea of what is radiation hormesis. Uh, radiation hormesis, the word hormesis is derived from the Greek word horma, hormein. Uh, and uh, that means basically to excite. Something that excites uh, is a hormeion, then the word hormesis uh, is uh, uh, adopted. And again, you find that hormesis is the origin of the word hormones. So we know that hormones uh, govern the biological processes in our body. Uh, in 1902, the English physiologist E. Starling discovered that an acid extract from the human duodenum contain the substance designated as secretine that when discharged into the bloodstream stimulated the pancreas to release its secretions when food has passed through the stomach. And uh, again, that E. Starling uh, in 1904, he coined the word hormone. And uh, that is a hormone then, the hormones uh, that we talk about that control biological processes uh, in our body. So a hormone is a substance that is produced by the body in small amount and carried out in the bloodstream to affect the function of many different organs in our body. Uh, biochemistry in the 1920s was not called biochemistry. Here you, at the university, you can get a course just in biochemistry, uh, but it was called physiological chemistry. <coughs> and it developed around the study of vitamins and hormones and low dose substances. When you use pharmacological, pharmacological substance in pharmacology, uh, uh, basically with vitamins, hormones, and so on, that was designated as physiological chemistry. Today is uh, named biochemistry. Uh, uh, basically two gentlemen, Southam and Ehrlich, noticed that large concentration of oak bark extract inhibited the growth of fungi. But in low doses, they led to the paradoxical effect of simulating fungal growth. So you find that uh, depending on the dose, there is a dose effect. Uh, large doses uh, are uh, beneficial, low doses are not beneficial. So he published, the two gentlemen published their work in the journal Phytopathology 1943, and uh, they start, changed the 
the word hormesis that describes stimulation by low doses of agents that are harmful or lethal at high doses. So some doses of uh, materials at low levels uh, are beneficial, at high levels are uh, uh, basically detrimental. And uh, that uh, can be ascribed to radiation in general. So what is hormesis? Uh, it came to refer to any stimulatory or beneficial effect induced by low doses of an agent that cannot be predicted from extrapolation of its determined det detrimental or lethal effects when administered at high doses. So if you consider it from the perspective uh, that applies to pharmacology in general, like uh, 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 different uh, medicines, different chemicals, but if you apply it to ionizing radiation, which we are interested in, uh, the topic raises heated debates. So I'll uh, just uh, cover the, the, the chapter, but then leave you to reach your own conclusion. Uh, uh, basically, the debate uh, comes out from the majority of health physicists that vehemently opposes the concept, calling it a pseudoscience. And the vocal minority of radiation biologists supporting it, uh, leading to basically, I warn you, it's an unsettled uh, controversy. Uh, in terms of uh, phy pharmacological, pharmacological history, uh, 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 the, uh, the pharmaceutical principle uh, to the ancient physicians was that a weak stimulus might stimulate what the same but stronger stimulus inhibits. But I, I repeat that a weak stimulus might stimulate what the same but stronger stimulus inhibits. And uh, basically, modern physicians adopted the principle in the manufacture. Oh, guess what? Vaccines. Okay. <laughs> uh, the university is uh, almost requiring everybody to get the vaccines before the beginning of classes. So vaccines is a hot topic uh, today. There are accounts of medieval criminals who would uh, taste their poison before offering it in large doses to kill their victims. Uh, alchemists apparently knew that the poison taken in small dosage was not dangerous. In fact, it can have curative effects. Many of the medications that are given to the individuals will cure them if it's a low dose, but would kill them if it's a large dose. And don't try it on yourself. If you drink Coke, for instance, or Pepsi, uh, you have the caffeine in it. The caffeine at low dose may be a stimulant, but if you take too much of it, it can kill you. Each physician carried the drug strychnine. That's a very famous drug in uh, the 1920s, 1930s in their bags and prescribed it as a stimulating tonic to their elderly patients. Only in high doses was strychnine considered as a harmful uh, poison. In fact, it is a poison and uh, it was used at the time. Uh, some historical interesting uh, uh, aspect is the uh, Russian history at the time of Catherine the Great. Uh, she had in her court a Russian monk uh, named Rasputin, and uh, he had lots of enemies, of course. He was uh, uh, the, in the court of uh, the, uh, the, uh, the empress, in that case, Catherine, and uh, uh, he knew that his enemies could uh, try to poison him uh, by uh, basically uh, by arsenic. That was the favorite uh, poison at the time. So what he did is that he was rumored to have taken low doses of arsenic and uh, intentionally conditioning himself in anticipation uh, of an assassination attempt. Uh, and in fact, they say that when his enemies gave him a large dose of arsenic to kill him, he was able to resist it uh, in general. So any substance can exhibit toxic effect if used in an improper dose, for instance, a severe lack of oxygen adversely affects the body at too low a concentration below 5%. A moderate oxygen deficiency, however, stimulate red blood cells production. So if you travel by airplane, some people suggest because the level of oxygen would be uh, low, uh, the body at high altitudes compensate for the low oxygen concentration by providing a large surface area containing hemoglobin to absorb the lower oxygen concentration. So you find that uh, long distance marathon athletes say from Ethiopia, a high elevation, excel when they come and run in a marathon, say in Chicago or in New York, uh, because their body has been uh, uh, conditioned to operate uh, uh, with a, a low oxygen uh, level uh, in general. Uh, common substances, as I suggested, nicotine. Uh, nicotine is uh, known to be 
and insecticides. Uh, and uh, if you uh, take it in small doses from a cigarette, it would not kill you, but in large doses, it will kill insects, hopefully. Caffeine, alcohol also uh, in small doses may uh, uh, be a stimulant, but at large doses, it can kill you. Even water, uh, if you drink too much water, uh, it can cause physiological effects that can harm you. Uh, they all have mild effects at low doses, but become toxic and even deadly at large doses. Nicotine, for instance, is extracted from the tobacco or nicotiana plant as is also used as an insecticide. Uh, as I suggested, pharmacologists use the toxicity of drugs uh, by uh, uh, considering that lethal dose for 50% of the population, what we mentioned as the LD90 dose, uh, that would be statistically significant in a very small population for all the lethal dose 10 value, it took a large number of test subjects and significant amounts of time to reach any significant, uh, uh, significant significance. So I want you uh, to take with a grain of salt what we are going to talk about uh, today. Let's talk about radiation hormesis and how we learned about radiation, unfortunately, uh, by some, uh, uh, unknown, when radiation was discovered by Henri Becquerel, uh, it became a cure-all, and uh, there were some industrial application used with it. For instance, I discovered that if you get some radium and put it into the, on the dial of watches, uh, the uh, numbers on the dials would glow in the dark. So they had uh, an industry of uh, young girls shown here. Uh, they were called the radium girls. They painted the dials of, uh, in that case, uh, watches, particularly clocks also, alarm clocks as well, clocks in uh, different environments where you wanted the, the numbers to glow in the dark. And they used the uh, paint brushes uh, to paint the dials of these watches and uh, uh, so that they would grow in, uh, glow in the dark. And some of them unknowingly were uh, uh, getting the point in their brush licked to give it a thin a point on their tongue. And in that case, the substance that they were using for painting the dial of the watches got incorporated in their body and radium is radioactive. They were affected in a way that was really uh, unexpected uh, in that case. Uh, I'll let you read the, the radiation here, uh, 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 exposure to radiation. One of them is those radium girls, obviously, uh, but uh, in different, uh, 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 radiation at some point became a cure-all. Uh, uh, snake oil salesmen, as they are called, started selling radiation and giving it uh, uh, curative uh, functions that they did not possess. So radiation was used uh, in a very deleterious way. I invite you to read the material, but I'll just show you, go over the pictures very quickly. Uh, quickly. Uh, that is a device that was called the Revigator. And uh, basically it would dispense water for you. And uh, uh, what was in it is uranium ore and they would pour water in it. And supposedly uh, the water would be a, a revigator or a rejuvenate you. Worse, they had bottles that you can buy uh, of what's called Redithor certified, certified radioactive water. It contains radium and uh, uh, basically radium-226 and radium-228, and it was sold in 1918. People would buy those little bottles and drink them, uh, like some of the sport medicines, uh, sports kind of uh, stimulants that are being sold today. One particular medical doctor uh, took that to an excess. He kept drinking many of those, and the radium deposited itself in its jaw, and they have to remove his jaw after the radiation uh, destroyed it. This is energy pills. They were called uh, strengths of iron, radion, energy of radium. They were sold on the market to give you energy as pills. Uh, this is the uh, device that was called the radium emanator. What does it, uh, was it emanating? It was emanating radon gas. Uh, so that contains radium there. And uh, the emanation uh, was definitely not beneficial uh, to the person uh, inhaling or, uh, or breathing it. Uh, they would, you could buy radioactive earths, radium limited box of radium containing soil. Uh, the, the radioactive earth uh, was sold also as some kind of a cure-all uh, 
uh, and people believed it at the time. Uh, this is even worse here, standard radium preparations. Uh, you would have small ampoules uh, containing radium solution for intravenous use. I would inject you uh, with that uh, radium solution supposedly to cure you from disease when in fact that would cause you uh, disease. And uh, indications uh, you could see here, uh, subacute and chronic joint and muscular conditions. So they use it for myalgia, which is pain in the muscle. Uh, and even for high blood pressure, uh, and nephritis uh, that would have to do with the kidneys and uh, arthritis, chronic joint uh, uh, pain in general. And that was a radium chemical company in Pittsburgh, uh, New York, Boston, Chicago, and San Francisco. Wow, uh, it was uh, basically uh, uh, the dot-com company of its time. Uh, this is the, they had aladdin, uh, kerosene lamps, and they had a thorium mantle, thorium, Oxide can take very high temperatures, but it was nevertheless radioactive. So if you'd use that mantle, you would be releasing some of the radioactivity in the thorium. Many, uh, 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 basically, uh, 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 <clears throat> uh, dinnerware. So these are plates and vases and cups. Uh, these are ceramics in general. Uh, to give them that beautiful color there, uh, they use uranium salts. So when you eat, you'll find that you are eating in a plate that contained uh, basically the, uh, uh, the decay products of uranium. Uh, the salts of uranium and thorium also were used to give uh, color to glass. So this is a little cup here. And this is a, a fruit juicer. You get cut the orange in half and then squeeze it on the top there to get the orange juice. Some people collect these uh, uh, plates and they call it the depression glass. And uh, they used uh, uranium salts as uh, coloring agents. I wouldn't use them today. There is no, because some of the glass obviously leaches into the food. Uh, this is what those uh, young girls, uh, the dial uh, watch painters were, uh, uh, were working on. They had the dials of uh, alarm clocks in that case, uh, uh, the dots here. Uh, basically they put in a little of that radium uh, isotopes so that it would grow uh, glow in the dark. Now, this is uh, another uh, 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 <clears throat> a conning operation where they sold you buttons. Do you see those buttons here that ladies would use on their dresses so that basically uh, the, ra the radium <laughs> would get their buttons to glow in the dark and they're very cheap, 25 cents each. Uh, not only that, but uh, ladies uh, worry about, uh, who worried about their beauty and the skin beauty. Uh, this is in French now, so radia, a creme, uh, which is called cream. Uh, they call it méthode method scientifique, scientific method uh, uh, de beauté for beauty. So supposedly if you would take that cream that contains thorium, uh, that would uh, make uh, your skin uh, uh, beautiful here, and uh, La, Syndro La Symphonie des Tains, the Symphony of the uh, Tains, uh, Thoradia, that contained in that case uh, uh, thorium, maquillage, uh, dermophil, uh, dermatological, uh, uh, really, uh, 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 maquillage, or just uh, uh, beauty kind of cream. Uh, this is a powder. Uh, ladies uh, would go to the powder room, still they call it today, uh, where they would put powder on their face, and that's pudre so radia, ra radium and adesorium, that's in French. Uh, and that's a doctor who's uh, selling it, Alfred Curie. <laughs> he took the name of Curie, uh, Madame Curie and Pierre Curie, uh, Marie Curie. Uh, this is another <laughs> new and startling beauty to the skin through radium, uh, radium, la radium uh, clay skin cream. They use clay uh, to beautify the cream, uh, the skin of uh, un, uh, uh, basically unsuspecting ladies. That's another one, uh, radium toilet requisitives. Today cream possessing radioactive properties, radio. Uh, so imagine how many people got themselves harmed uh, by those uh, fly by uh, uh, night uh, operators there. Uh, and uh, art uh, radium cream, yeah, they buy the cream, so a beauty aid, but in fact it was uh, a harmful 
uh, to their body and uh, in their hands, uh, some part would be absorbed in the rest of their body. Okay, let's uh, become a little more scientific here. Let us talk about the uh, linear no threshold LNT risk dose relationship. I've shown you a version of it in the previous chapter, uh, but uh, it turns out that from our uh, observations again of the uh, period in the period of 1950 to 2000, uh, the people who survived the atomic bombings in Hiroshima and Nagasaki uh, basically volunteered to study the effects of their uh, doses, the, the large doses of radiation that they received from neutrons and gamma rays from the bombings in that case. And uh, uh, the uh, different number of subjects, that, that was like a large number, so it's a, an interesting uh, really survey or experiment, uh, 86,611 people uh, received different doses of radiation depending on how far they were from the center or ground zero of the explosion. This is the, uh, the weighted colon effective dose as measured in sievert. You see the unit here, the sievert. And uh, in that case, uh, you notice that some of them got cancer deaths uh, and uh, some part of them got it from the natural background. So you could see here, uh, this is a very low dose and the cancer deaths basically came into the colon cancer, which is a very common uh, form of cancer. And uh, from the background, it was 4,282. So the excess really uh, was only uh, uh, two people coming out from the exposure of a very low dose of radiation from the bombing. The large doses of uh, 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 effects came in from uh, the 0.5 to 1 sievert of radiation. So the, uh, uh, if you subtract, uh, 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 calculate how many deaths occurred, subtract from it what you expect from the natural background. So 116 people uh, died from that dose. So in that case, we have a curve uh, that shows us the excess relative risk uh, compared to the dose in milli sievert. Uh, the error bar, as you could see, is quite large here. It's quite large. Uh, and uh, you'll find that uh, uh, this is uh, what we would consider the cancer uh, uh, mortality excess risk uh, in the atomic bomb survivors cohort. Cohort is a term that says a group. Over the period 1950 to 1960, you find that it's almost like a linear fit. Uh, the larger the dose that they received, the higher the excess relative uh, risk, uh, the vertical part represents a 90% confidence interval. It's not one standard deviation only, it's two standard deviation. Uh, so basically you have taking the area, 90% of the area under a normal distribution. And uh, the, in that case, the error bar is quite uh, large. It was, that was published in 2004 uh, in China. Uh, the International Commission on Radiation Protection, that's uh, what you mentioned in the sets of the criteria uh, for radiation here, uh, studied that uh, what I mentioned as a linear uh, no threshold relationship. So in general, uh, we expect the excess cancer deaths or risk uh, to increase uh, linearly. Uh, these are known effects. Uh, and uh, our known effects really that we can trust statistically are radiation doses above 50 rem. Uh, however, some people suggest that uh, uh, at low doses of radiation, uh, you find that the risk is zero uh, below a certain dose here. And uh, in fact, uh, they can take that curve and dip it to the bottom here, like this dip uh, below the linear uh, threshold there that suggests that at low doses of radiation could be beneficial, not uh, harmful in that case. And that is the whole idea of uh, hormesis, that they suggest that if you use low doses of radiation, uh, you'll find that uh, it may be beneficial. And uh, that is uh, linear, no threshold re relationship. This is a threshold here, that below a certain dose of radiation, no harm can be noticed. Uh, if you take the linear relationship from the high doses and extrapolate to zero, this is the accepted norm but some people suggest low doses will lead to a beneficial uh, effect of low doses of radiation. 
the slope of that curve is taken as a slope by which we uh, consider the how uh, radiation doses like the two uh, may, uh, the two RAM per person per year average over five years uh, criterion was set up. Uh, the slope of that curve is if we take the slope of the linear hypothesis. So the linear hypothesis is the accepted norm for the protection against radiation uh, today, uh, even though people discuss that curve number two and three, uh, but we are bound really to that slope. That slope is uh, 0.79 divided into uh, 110. So we accept the risk uh, of uh, uh, <clears throat> exposure to radiation as being eight, 10 to the minus four uh, cancer deaths per centisiever of population dose. Remember we defined the population dose. Uh, so comparison for comparison, there exists a probability of 18% for an individual of contracting cancer from all other environmental factors. So even though radiation has been used uh, uh, in the past uh, uh, for very uh, bad, uh, uh, just commercial and uh, uh, snake oil kind of salesmanship, uh, the, uh, we only accept the linear uh, dose hypothesis and we extrapolate uh, to the uh, zero level. However, some people suggest that, uh, and they are really very serious about it, uh, that uh, uh, low doses of radiation can be beneficial. And they observed that in uh, lab animals that had low doses of radiation and they survived longer than the other uh, animal uh, in uh, laboratory animals that were uh, used in the same laboratories uh, in general. So in that case, uh, for instance, uh, a Canadian survey of the mortality caused by cancer at nuclear power plant, uh, it was found that uh, uh, the mortality is 58% lower than the national average in Canada. Oh, wow. That says, oh, exposure to radiation is beneficial. But some people would argue that, well, uh, uh, people in nuclear power plant are better monitored for their health and uh, uh, taken care of, uh, and they have a better standard of living than the rest of the national average uh, population in Canada. So it is debatable. In England, Kendall reported that the cancer frequency again among nuclear power plant workers was lower than the national average. This could be a reflection, as I suggested, of better working conditions and health screening and care among these workers rather than a hormetic effect. So we have to be careful here not to accept the statistics at face uh, value. There may be other factors uh, that play an important role. Uh, one, uh, one important aspect is that if you are going making a good living, you can get better health care. And uh, of course, you would have an advantage over the rest of the population. There have been uh, studies also in on environmental radiation studies of people living in high radiation areas in general. Some people suggest different uh, hormesis mechanisms, basically uh, cellular stimulation of the immune system. Uh, if the immune system is stimulated to fight uh, 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 invasion by bacteria and viruses, then uh, that can explain the effect of uh, low doses of radiation. Uh, the process of uh, DNA repair after uh, damage by radiation is also a possibility and you stimulate that repair process, you stimulate the immune system. In fact, in fact uh, it suggests uh, chemical processes like molecular free radical detoxification. So it's a topic for uh, research and uh, the main emphasis has been on what uh, they call in hormesis, radiation hormesis, the process of radiation free uh, conditioning. So basically uh, some uh, researchers reported that the single exposure of this type of cells that they consider in lab laboratory studies, in vitro meaning in the lab, uh, in, in vivo would be in humans, and uh, to low doses 0.1 centigrade or red, uh, this is at the background per capita yearly dose level of 100 milliram reduces the risk of neoplastic transformations to below the spontaneous inducement level. Neoplastic means cancerous transformations in general. So again, they, uh, there are studies that suggest low doses of radiation can be beneficial. Well, do we accept that? We don't know. We don't have really uh, uh, in control uh, uh, 
yeah, sure evidence that uh, uh, radiation hormesis is really beneficial. Uh, if radiation hormesis can be better understood on the basis of new knowledge in genomic and proteomics, which is uh, really the basis of our new uh, so-called vaccine. They're not vaccine, they're really more like genetic kind of uh, uh, treatments uh, generating, say, the uh, messenger RNA uh, uh, spike proteins of the COVID-19 <laughs> virus. Some of that knowledge can be applied uh, and uh, to uh, radiation hormesis for, for those of you who studied maybe as part of uh, uh, biomolecular engineering. Uh, uh, if it is a real phenomenon, it will great benefit can be derived in the fight against cancer, for instance. According to a gentleman in the field, they're lucky. Uh, a third of all cancer deaths may be premature and could be preventable by low level radiation precondition. So that would be a great achievement if indeed uh, it is true. However, radiation hormesis is yet not considered by many people as a valid scientific reality since ionizing radiation is harmful to some degree. Nevertheless, low levels of radiation have been essential for the process of evolution, which would have been much slower if the levels of ionizing radiation would have been much lower on the planet Earth. Uh, radiation has been essential for the successful mutations favoring the adaptation of life to new circumstances and to biological uh, the, uh, diversity. And uh, then I repeat what I said earlier. The implication is that even though radiation may be harmful to a single individual, it favors a whole species on the evolutionary scale because it helps the species adapt to new environmental uh, conditions. When incremental radiation exposure increases the probability of occurrence of some harm, the marginal cost at low doses may be small and then becomes larger at high doses. A marginal cost against benefit model that considers both effects would be needed to adequately describe the effects of radiation at low and high dose levels. Yet the consensus from the atomic bomb survivor study is that, and this is what we have to adopt regarding radiation hormesis, that quote, in the presence of available data, it is neither sound statistical interpretation nor prudent risk evaluation to take the view that the risk should be considered as zero in some low level range due to lack of statistical significance when restricting uh, attention uh, to this range. And that is what we should basically adopt because that is the scientific consensus at that time. I'll go back again to the chat room. We still have time to go. And uh, in that case, uh, if you have questions, please pose your questions before we start on uh, non-ionizing radiation, which is uh, uh, an, uh, an aspect of the new age we are living in. Now that chapter can save your life, the next one. Uh, if you have no questions, I'll share the screen. And uh, you probably would like to let uh, your friends know about it. Uh, this is not standard, again, like hormesis. It is not standard uh, knowledge, but uh, I'll cover it because it is of great interest to uh, our new kind of uh, new generations. Uh, I quote here Thomas Paine, if there must be trouble, let it be in my day that my child may have peace. So let us see what is uh, uh, the situation we are talking about here. Definitely, we know that ionizing radiation is a concern when we use high doses of radiation uh, and uh, high, uh, high, high energy radiation that has to do with the energy of the radiation today. Uh, when you deal with uh, uh, gamma rays, uh, this is electromagnetic radiation coming out from the nucleus, primarily or very high energetic uh, particles, electrons or gamma rays. Uh, we uh, basically uh, call it, uh, <clears throat> uh, 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 and the energy is high enough, the frequency is very high or the wavelength is very short, uh, that can cause ionization. But there is uh, radiation that we are exposed to more so in our technological society today uh, that is in the microwave radiation. And uh, well, think about uh, 4G, fourth generation uh, phones and 5G, uh, the new uh, fifth generation uh, phone that is being implemented all over the world. 
and that is in the microwave region. It is not ionizing. It doesn't have enough energy to ionize the uh, molecules of DNA or break the strands of the chromosomes in the cells, uh, in the uh, nuclei of our cell. However, uh, we are subjected every day today in our my, in technological societies, uh, society to microwaves and lasers. And uh, they are considered as forms of non-ionizing radiation. So if you talk about mobile cellular phones, uh, they transmit and receive information in the microwave part of the electromagnetic spectrum. These have become a hundred billion uh, dollars industry per year. And here I have uh, my own phone in the pocket of my shirt. So uh, it is not just that uh, it is ubiquitous. In fact, you cannot use a computer now without uh, that checking uh, your uh, uh, the two stage kind of uh, 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 identification, uh, you use both the computer, uh, which uses microwave, and your phone that also uses uh, microwave. 650 million phones are sold uh, uh, a long time ago, 2005, and about uh, more than 1.5 billion people all over the world use them. And if you go to Wikipedia, I'll quote it, uh, ultraviolet light can cause burns to skin and cataracts to the eyes. Ultraviolet is classified into near, medium, and far ultraviolet according to energy, where near and medium ultraviolet are technically non-ionizing, but where all ultraviolet wavelength can cause photochemical reactions that to some extent mimic ionization, including DNA damage and carcinogenesis. So that is a new realization in a new world that we are living in, in our technological society. Current plans, uh, if you know already, uh, and they're being touted as uh, really something really new and very uh, useful is to, to place small uh, 5G or uh, fifth generation cell towers about 300 meters in large cities. And uh, this 5G small cell antennas uh, will uh, really result in a continuous exposure of everyone living nearby and everyone walking down the street. So in large cities that are in, being installed at very short distances uh, just to guide you, say, to go to a particular restaurant or to go to a particular shop when you are shopping. Uh, the increased exposures will increase risk of cancer and other diseases such as electrohypersensitivity. The World Health Organization, uh, international agency, uh, basically on uh, research on cancer, uh, classified the risk as, quote, possibly carcinogenic to humans. So this is a repeated here, the WHO, considers these 5G uh, small cell antennas, microwave antennas as possibly the radiation itself uh, as possibly carcinogenic to humans. Given the potential consequences of public health of this classification and findings, it is important that additional research be conducted into the long-term heavy use of mobile phones. Pending the availability of such information, it is important to take pragmatic measures to reduce exposure such as hand-free devices, or maybe using texting rather than the microwave phones themselves. And as you could see here, it is very ubiquitous. It's showing here uh, different sources of radiation uh, to radio frequency radiation, RF, oh, the phones, the computers, uh, 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 meters. In fact, a meter on your wall is uh, sending a wave that measures your consumption of electricity and uh, basically, uh, 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 Wi-Fi, like you, I am right now per personally uh, communicating with a router uh, uh, with my computer. And that is not exposing uh, only uh, individuals above the age of 18, like when you mentioned the uh, limits to radiation exposure, you'll find that it's used also for small children where the effect of sensitivity is much uh, very high. Now remember again that the energy carried by a photon in the electromagnetic spectrum is H nu. Nu, uh, here that's a Greek N, a Greek alphabet N. H is a blank constant, and uh, the energy in H nu is in units of electron volt. And uh, nu here is equal to the speed of light divided into the wave length. And the frequency is uh, basically uh, <coughs> Hertz, the units are Hertz, or uh, 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 per second, or one second minus one, and C, the speed of light, and 
uh, uh, lambda is the wavelength. So radiation of high frequency or uh, uh, short wavelengths, because if you put a small number in the denominator, it gives you a large uh, frequency, uh, can uh, be measured in terms of electron volts uh, in general. Since microwaves have a longer wavelengths, consequently a lower frequency than X-rays or gamma rays, the energy uh, they carry definitely is less than X-rays or gamma rays, which have been uh, our area of interest in uh, nuclear applications. Uh, whereas X and gamma rays with their high energy in the range of kilo to million electron volts uh, can break molecular bonds and cause the creation of ions or ionization, microwaves do not carry enough energy to cause ionizations. Uh, cellular phones use frequencies in the range of 900 hertz or cycles per second, corresponding to about a one foot wavelength. Uh, so that's not uh, in centimeters or millimeters, it's uh, the wavelength is in uh, one foot. Uh, radio frequency in the range of one to 10 meters wavelengths compared with visible light is one half a millionth of a meter, whereas ionizing radiation is at the 10 billionth of a meter wavelength. You could see that we are in a wavelength that is uh, very different uh, and there is no cause for <laughs> immediate alarm there. Microwave radiation from cellular phone is classified as non-ionizing so its effects are considered as less serious than ionizing radiation, such as X-rays and gamma rays. However, cellular four antennas emit when in use microwaves that deposit energy in vital organs. So if you have the, your phone right next to your chest, your chest is being affected. When you hold the phone close to your ear, uh oh, now that becomes even more serious because you have vital organs in the ear, in the eyes and the brain. And uh, so in that case, uh, uh, the brain is affected if you talk for a long distance on your phone. In addition, when the phone is interacting with its antenna, uh, the power uh, is raised uh, significantly. So it's not a matter of just the wavelengths, but also the power level at which energy uh, and radiation is emitted, not just during the active usage, but also uh, during uh, just uh, simply you're walking around with your phone, even though you are not using it, there is continuous communication between the phone and the antenna so that they can locate uh, where you are. This is just some kind of uh, 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 <laughs> an idea of the uh, uh, mercantile idea so that they can locate where you are and direct you say uh, to favorite restaurants uh, uh, or uh, favorite shops. So basically radiation is emitted not just during active usage, but also during the standby mode since the cellular phone is continuously polling for the location of the nearest cellular uh, tower. So that's a continuous uh, form of uh, uh, radiation in general. Uh, just uh, as uh, a way of looking at the electromagnetic spectrum, our senses are very limited. Uh, what we see is only the light, uh, the visible light uh, above it, you have the ultraviolet radiation, which means shorter wavelengths. You are approaching the X-rays and the gamma rays. And below the range of uh, wavelengths of the visible light, we have basically infrared or heat radiation. And the microwaves are right here. Uh, basically, wavelengths is in the one centimeter compared to the one micrometer or 10 to the minus eight centimeter, which is the angstrom unit and uh, much, of course, shorter uh, to put things in perspective than gamma rays, which would have a wavelength of 10 to the minus five uh, uh, nanometers. Nano is 10 to the minus uh, nine uh, in general. Uh, so uh, what are the devices, uh, ranges of using a microwave radiation? You find that uh, uh, in the region of ionizing, while we're talking X-rays and gamma rays, so medical X-rays, Radioactive sources uh, are really in the range of the uh, ionizing radiation. If you do arc welding, you are in the close to the visible part of the spectrum. Uh, if uh, you use uh, heat, infrared, uh, and uh, uh, then you are in that part of the spectrum where it is non-ionizing. But so are microwave ovens, uh, FM and AM radios and TV. And power lines, in fact, uh, have basically the 50 or 60 cycles per second uh, uh, 
uh, uh, frequency of the electrical uh, system. Uh, however, uh, the use of uh, uh, devices that use microwaves is very ubiquitous all over the place. So for instance, if you live in an apartment building, uh, at the entrance, uh, you find uh, something, a view like this. Uh, this is a bank uh, of, well, wireless. In that case, I use <laughs> microwave radiation, smart meters at an apartment concept. So whoever is living next to those is definitely being subjected to uh, the microwave background. And uh, if you have one of these, even at a home, uh, it may be positioned uh, right next to your living room on the chair where you sit down to watch the TV. So it uses uh, uh, a wireless kind of uh, 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 connection. Uh, the most known uh, uh, aspects of uh, my, the microwave use is in that range here, which is below uh, the infrared. It is not, it, it's below the infrared, which is heat. And microwaves, as we know, are used in ovens, microwave ovens, cellular phones, uh, cordless phones, and Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi is when uh, you use your computer connected to a router, as I am doing myself uh, right now. So we are using in our technological societies the microwave region, which is non-ionizing. But look what uh, where our concern starts uh, developing. Uh, when you have a phone, for instance, let's take the example of a phone on a standby basis, you'll find that the field strengths here measured in uh, volts per meter. Uh, is very low on a standby. Now, when your phone starts ringing, the power increases very dramatically. Uh, and uh, uh, on the y-axis, we are showing here the intensity in volts per meter. Volts per meter is the intensity of the electric field. Uh, the voltage is scalar quantity and uh, dV by uh, dx is the strength of the electric field. And uh, uh, when it rings, you'll find that basically your volts per meter increases dramatically. But now start speaking on the phone, look at how much the power from standby is increasing. If you talk, you'll find that the power in your phone consumption, and that's why you use up your battery, obviously, increases very dramatically. If you listen, the power decreases back again to almost a standby basis. But as you talk, it goes up again and again. And at the end of the call, it comes back to uh, the lower level. But uh, the phone, unfortunately, is on all the time, as I suggested, calling the location of the user in general. And uh, there is, uh, ex there are experiments that uh, this, uh, uh, micro uh, this uh, uh, microwave emissions affect biological matter. So some people in India uh, try to study uh, an effect happening on bees. And uh, the effect is designated as the colony collapse uh, syndrome. Uh, and in the colony collapse syndrome, they placed, oh, the bees simply uh, evacuate their beehive and they get out and not return to the beehive for some reason that people are still speculating about. It could be parasites, it could be disease. And some people uh, ran experiments in which they placed a phone inside a beehive. And, uh, and uh, basically uh, they documented their work in published papers and they used uh, some control hives uh, and then they used a test hive uh, and uh, they placed a phone in them for 10 days, each one of them. And uh, in the control hives, all the workers returned back to the beehives. But after a few, day, a few days, 10 days uh, of using a, placing a phone inside a beehive, and the phone was not used, obviously it was sitting there at the standby level. After a few days, the workers never returned to the hive. So definitely there is a biological effect where the bees in that case are like the uh, uh, what uh, proverbial kind of, uh, 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 proverbial uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, alert to us that microwave radiation have an effect on biological uh, matter. In the colony uh, collapse disorder, basically you'll find that something similar occurs. Uh, the thriving bees would be deserted and then only the queen, some eggs and some hive uh, immature workers are left in the system. And that's basically only 
for 10 minutes daily. Radiation affecting honeybees 10 uh, days per day. So that is almost like the proverbial canary in the coal mine. Uh, coal miners used to go down in the coal mine carrying a canary, canary in a cage, canary bird in a cage, and uh, the canary would uh, uh, warn them against the presence of methane gas, which is poisoning, poisonous in that case, uh, by dying and giving or feeling sick to, uh, uh, as a warning to the uh, miners. So the bees here are acting as the canary in the coal mine, warning them, warning us that uh, so there is some biological effect that we may have to worry uh, about. Uh, another uh, effect that we have to worry about is the study by Rachel Carson. And uh, in that case, she warned us about the effect of an insecticide, DDT. And uh, uh, she published a book uh, 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 titled Silent Spring. You may like to go and look at it, uh, maybe on Wikipedia or read the book. And she warned us that the DDT insecticide causes the eggs of birds to become brittle. So she said, called the book Silent Spring on the basis that the DDT, which is used to combat, in that case, mosquitoes, and it's still being used all over the world, uh, that it can uh, kill all the uh, birds, and then we end up with a silent spring. So this is a situation where we have now a silent buzzing spring, meaning that we not have insects and the insects are a food of the uh, birds. So still it would affect the birds in an indirect way. Uh, there are standards uh, for the use of uh, uh, microwave radiation. Uh, again, uh, microwave still carries energy, H nu, and uh, basically we measure the energy absorption by what's called the specific absorption rate. So the specific absorption rate, specific means per unit mass. So this is the energy absorbed in joules per organ mass. The organ could be your uh, brain, you could be your ear, it could be uh, any organ in the body uh, divided by the organ mass and uh, uh, it's a power absorbed. So it's joules per second, the time over which you are irradiating the organ. So it becomes uh, units of joule per second, which is watts, and uh, the organ mass, uh, the brain or the eyes or the ear uh, is in kilograms. So there are regulations, in fact, that regulate the level between 0.5 and 1 watts per kilogram uh, as a measure of the rate of radio frequency absorption or power absorption uh, regulated in the United States. So the specific or the SAR uh, specific absorption rate radiation dose rate exposure limit recommended by the International Commission. Now there is a commission on non-ionizing radiation, not on ionizing radiation, is two watts per kilogram. And this is the highest level that you should allow yourself or your friends or your parents or your children uh, when you get children to be exposed to. And uh, basically this uh, shows here that uh, the greatest exposure uh, of the head and fetus at the end of pregnancy uh, to uh, based uh, to a fetus that is affected by dipole antenna. So uh, some ladies would carry their phone uh, uh, in their purse or around their waist when they're pregnant. And basically there is a great warning about that situation, especially in younger children. And this is an exposure of the head of an infant to uh, the uh, uh, microwave uh, radiation, and uh, some people carry their phone there on in the pan and the pockets in their pants, uh, and then it exposes the reproductive organs of the gentleman right there next to the gonads, as well as affecting the bone marrow uh, where uh, the white blood cells are formed. And uh, this is a modeled microwave radiation dose to uh, uh, an infant or a young uh, kid. Uh, uh, when somebody talks on the four. So that's a six year old exposure in general. There have been lots of studies in Europe, particularly the Europeans are more concerned about it than we are in the United States. Uh, you can read about it uh, for let us, let us read about one of them. A study conducted by the European Union researchers, the REFLEX study as it's called, 
uh, it was conducted by 12 research group in seven European countries. It did not prove that mobile phones are a definite risk to health, but they considered that more research is needed to see if effects can also be found outside a lab. But uh, some other studies, uh, the British National Radiological Protection Study, uh, basically in 2006, recommended a precautionary approach because there is still no hard evidence that the health of the public in general has been adversely affected by the use of mobile phone technology. There was a study in Sweden, uh, and all those studies are uh, controversial in that uh, the Nor study in Norway, uh, another study, the British Mobile Telecommunication Health Research uh, Study, uh, because some studies show that there may be uh, a deleterious effect, especially uh, to young kids and young children. And uh, uh, parents uh, like to know uh, to stay in contact with their children. So even though they may be uh, below the age even of teenagers, uh, they provide them with phones that they can use all the time at school and communicate with their parents. Now, what has been observed is the following. Uh, acoustic neuromas uh, have been noticed. Acoustic neuromas are low growing cancers that only affect the function of the ear. Notice that you hold your phone to your ear when you talk to it, and it can uh, lead to the loss of hearing, not only hearing, but balance. A person cannot walk now because our ear helps us balance ourselves when we walk. They do not metastasize to other parts of the body, but uh, there is a public concern that the use of mobile phones uh, could increase the risk of brain uh, tumors, uh, not just uh, uh, the uh, ear, but also the whole brain. Uh, the gliomas are the most common type of brain tumors. And the Swedish study suggested that there was an increased risk of contracting brain cancer uh, among rural cell phone uh, users because the uh, power uh, of the antennas there are uh, much higher. Uh, there is an effect of the head size. And again, the World uh, Health Organization uh, basically suggested that it can cause uh, some forms of cancer. It has effect on the brain activity from studies that were conducted in different parts. And uh, there is another study, Ramazzini study. So I suggest that some of you who would uh, be interested in biology would uh, study the effects of uh, non-ionizing radiation in our new technological society in the same way uh, that many people have studied the effects of, uh, of ionizing radiation. Uh, these uh, uh, ideas can also be beneficial. Let's talk, for instance, about uh, ultraviolet radiation. Uh, in the context of that uh, COVID-19, uh, you notice that this is what's used in China. Uh, uh, Shanghai, China, on March 2010, uh, buses are placed inside whole enclosures where the whole bus is irradiated with microwave radiation. And that's why they were able, to a certain extent, uh, part of their uh, uh, combating the COVID-19. The ultraviolet would kill the viruses uh, in general. Uh, 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 the, uh, uh, in China, you can buy a microwave, uh, sorry, a, a dishwasher that would disinfect the, uh, the, the material, anything that you're uh, washing uh, with a, some kind of exposure to ultraviolet radiation. In the United States, uh, uh, people are... Uh, uh, very uh, foolhardy. For instance, this is a baby that is now in the crib uh, being exposed to radio frequency emissions from a two-way tablets and laptop device. That is very risky according to many people. And uh, we have a, a word that uh, some uh, uh, caricaturists uh, have uh, uh, basically <laughs> Uh, criticized uh, where people are walking, they're not talking to each other anymore. <laughs> they're just talking on their cellular phones. And even in, uh, uh, in a Disney cartoon here, uh, uh, you know, basically Cinderella may be there or Snow White uh, is not talking to uh, the, uh, the prince there. She's talk he's talking on the phone and she's talking on the phone. So <laughs> they're being exposed to radiation in general. Uh, definitely, some studies show that prenatal radio frequency exposure causes significant behavior impact in adults in terms of affecting the memory, hyperactivity, anxiety, and causing fear in some people without uh, their knowing why they are fearful. Uh, this is a problem that haven't basically 
invasive to multiple uh, uh, primary mirror in its uh, tumors, cancers in that case, uh, in a Chinese American woman who used cell phone four hours a day, uh, she stored it in her bra for 10 years. So and that is cancers uh, of the breast. So don't, for our young ladies, do not store your phone uh, uh, near uh, your breast. Case reports, 21 year old multifocal tumors died with cell phone kept in bra. There is definitely uh, a, uh, some kind of a possible correlation between the two. So we are all warned. Glioma risk three found in all case control studies published since this study. Uh, basically you find that uh, uh, it can cause uh, brain uh, as well as ear cancers in general. So in conclusion, uh, young adults are advised to use mobile phones for a short, as short a time as possible. This is one of the precepts of protecting against radiation uh, is the time exposure. Since our brain and eyes tissues are still in a formative stage and are consequently more vulnerable to the effects of radiation. Using text messaging and a phone with a low SAR uh, value are also recommended. Uh, turning off the phone when not in use is also the most effective protection measure and uh, uh, the, to reduce the risk, the use of hand-free cellular phones is advisable. And I can add here another sentence. If you really want uh, to uh, disconnect your phone from the grid, uh, basically wrap it up in aluminum foil inside the conductor, the aluminum in that case, the electric field by definition is zero. And you can basically turn off or place it in uh, a, uh, a tin can when not in use to reduce the amount of exposure to uh, non-ionizing radiation. Lots of research is still needed in that particular field. And some of you say in uh, molecular engineering or bioengineering will uh, be contributing to more knowledge about uh, uh, our use of uh, non-ionizing radiation, which is extremely ubiquitous in our modern society. I'll uh, remain uh, uh, connected uh, uh, to the rest of the afternoon for any questions in the chat uh, room. So please uh, 